Hello class, good day. This is John Callum from KHL Motorsport. And we're now discussing and continuing our series of videos regarding the 1NZFE swap to the Corolla E100 big body chassis. So again, this is chapter 2 of the series, installing the engine. So let's review first what we discussed in the previous chapter. The 1NZFE it's a Toyota engine, it's cheap, economical, and a decent power plant that uh, is a good engine swap candidate to older front-wheel drive cars. The NZ engine comes in 1300 and 1500 cc displacements. And of course, there are various uh, revisions to the engine. There are early types, there are late types. Major differentiating factor is the throttle body as far as this swap is concerned. Also, the presence and and or absence of a power steering pump so the easier swap for this chassis is an earlier one with a cable actuated throttle body but you can work with any NZ variant you just have to retrofit for the electronic throttle control where are we installing this one NZ FE engine so it's a local EE100 so it's originally fitted with a 2E which is the 1.3 liter carb but the engine is not present. It's basically a shell that uh, we received in the shop. So it has no running gear, not even the fuel tank, no wiring whatsoever. So it's literally a shell that we have to assemble and make into a running car. The project brief, this is just going to be a race car. It's not a street car per se. We're trying to put air conditioning. We're trying to put some accoutrement some accessories to it to make it drivable to and from races but it's practically a race car for various grassroots motorsport training practices and by the way it's not really our car it's a customer's car this is the parts menu that we are using so again the one in ZFE engine came at Toyota Porte it was an automatic transmission model so it did not come with a transmission, but it is a long block with complete accessories, ECU, and wiring harness. We bought separately a C52 transmission. The only benefit to that is it had a TRD LSD, but it came from a 4AGE of some kind. So in order to fit it, we got ourselves a 2NZ bell housing for the manual transmission with matching shift fork and, and secondary clutch cylinder. And of course, a new clutch set that is basically the same between the 4AFE and the NZ engine. We also got ourselves the matching Corolla axles, shifter, and shifter cables. And we also got ourselves the complete transmission support. There are three of them, the front, rear, and driver side transmission supports for the E100 Corolla. We also modified the one NZ exhaust manifold that came with the engine and we made custom power steering high pressure lines to make the hydraulic power steering system to work. With any engine swap, I think the co major concern that everyone should have and should be cognizant of are the following. And the major issue, of course, to get any engine swap running is the wiring. Can you use the ECU that came with the engine? Do you have to go standalone? If you're going to use a stock ECU, does it have CAN bus? Does it have to communicate with other systems in the car? Does it have an immobilizer? Do you need to have uh, the key that came with the engine in order for it to run? But let's try to answer these questions one by one uh, with regards to this specific engine swap that we're discussing. Okay, does it fit? Uh, the engine bay is oversized for the size of the engine so it, there's lots of space all around the engine front back and side to side there's a bit of a minor clearancing required at the lower cross member but it's very minor one concern that was raised to us is if you look at the picture of the engine bay the engine is mounted pretty low so that's good for center of gravity but that may not be good for the location of the crankcase to the ground if you're going to use it at a rally situation or you're driving in rough roads or you fear of foreign object damage on the highway, you may want to secure the crankcase by putting some skid plates. But um, based on an eyeball inspection, it's not so bad. It's not that low. 
Next question. How about the alignment of the engine and the engine supports? The good thing about this engine swap is you don't have to worry too much about engine support. You only have to fabricate one bracket to mount the engine to the passenger side chassis rail. And you can reuse three supports which is related to the transmission side. So you don't really have to align axles. You can reuse the axles of the Corolla. You don't have to lengthen them, shorten them, whatever. It really simplifies matters when it comes to locating the engine. However, you have to modify the transmission. If you are reusing your 4AFE transmission, you have to change the bell housing, shift fork and clutch secondary to NZ items. If your engine comes with a manual transmission, I'm not 100% sure about this. In my opinion, you can just reuse the axles and the transmission supports. Retrofit it to the NZ transmission. Uh, but since we are using a C52 from a 4A FE, 4A GE, we had to open up the transmission to replace the bell housing, which we had to do anyway because we were doubtful of the condition of the C52 transmission that we received. Is there space for the radiator? Definitely. We used an oversized radiator for the big body. We bought a brand new unit. We just had to reroute the coolant hoses, which isn't really much of a problem. Just have to link a couple of uh, hoses together in order to make it compatible with the existing radiator setup. You may have to use some reducers as I believe the hoses for the 1NZ are a different diameter to the big body. But uh, you'll be able to figure that out. And like what I said, there are no clearance issues for the alternator, compressor, power steering pump. It's so, so loose inside the engine bay. It's gonna be a pleasure to work on this power plant uh, should there be any issues. One concern for clearance um, that we have seen is that the intake hose and air cleaner that came from the Porte may be a bit too high. Careful mounting of the stock intake piping and the air cleaner is necessary. But if you're gonna use aftermarket intake, then you can do whatever. There's also space for the battery. You can put the battery in the stock location. The major concern in any engine swap is the wiring. And uh, the difficulty of it, if you are going to do it yourself, uh, good luck. But uh, if you're going to get uh, an experienced electrician to do it, um, they normally can do it because you just basically have to provide a fused power source to the ECU and an ignition source from uh, your ignition key to control harness of the 1NZ. Since we're using a 1NZ that was originally fitted with an automatic, we were told that the early automatic ECUs will run with uh, the manual transmission and it will throw a check engine light but it's supposed to run with no problems. It remains to be seen as we haven't uh, touched on the car for several months and we are just gonna get back to it pretty soon. The early 1NZ ECU might not rely on complex CAN bus systems and immobilizer. We're lucky that we will be relying on the early 1NZ ECU electronics. But if you have a later engine swap, that might be a major, major issue for you. It should be compatible with the stock gauges, but you have to rewire it a lot. It is to be finalized. You can always go aftermarket gauges if you don't want the originality, but uh, I'm sure it's not a major issue. If you're gonna undertake the swap, whether you're gonna have it done by somebody or you're gonna attempt doing it yourself, best to secure your own copy of the wiring diagram where the engine came from, the, the chassis diagram for your car that you're swapping it into. That really helps as far as the ignition switch, tapping it into the car's fuse box and all those things it will really help you out a lot it's not difficult to wire it might be a hornet's nest it might go over your head but if you do it uh, 
with a clear head and a systematic method, it won't be so difficult. Okay, what are the issues that we've experienced so far? Again, we mentioned the cross-member clearance and the oil pan issue, so we're not going to delve into that so much. Major concern while you're doing this engine swap is fueling. Because the NZ engine, any NZ engine that we know about, uh, they all feature a returnless fuel system. While the standard 4AFE, which is also fuel injected, that engine is a return style. What do you mean by returnless fuel system, return style fuel system? It's basically this. This is basically the diagram. Fuel goes to the injectors and then there's a fuel pressure regulator that controls the pressure to the injectors. And then the regulator diverts the excess fuel back to the fuel tank. Uh, so fuel has to go all the way to the engine. The pressure of the fuel supply is regulated at the engine side. After it's regulated, it returns back to the fuel tank. That's basically the system of most 90s uh, fuel injection systems. But uh, when it came to the 1NZ, it's now a returnless system where the fuel pressure is regulated at the fuel tank itself. So it's just constant pressure going to the fuel rail. Is you basically have to figure out how to regulate the pressure. Because if you have too much pressure in the fuel system, you may blow out your injectors. The injectors are also sensitive devices, so too much fuel pressure is not good. So what are your options? So option one, don't bother with it, but you'll screw up your injectors for sure. We're going to install an aftermarket regulator uh, in line from between the fuel tank and the fuel rail. We're also going to have it return back into the engine uh, using the old uh, fuel system lines that came with the car. You can buy cheap aftermarket fuel pressure regulators online. Exhaust manifold. You have to definitely modify the stock exhaust manifold that came with the 1NZ because the out outlet of the manifold uh, dumps into the rack and pinion which is not good but the good thing about the 1NZ exhaust manifold it's not cast it's actually a tubular manifold and you can always weld on new piping at a certain part of it and make it dump properly beneath the rack and pinion so that's what we did or you can always have custom headers made. That's one interesting thing about the 1NZ is that the exhaust outlet is on the firewall side. Not like the 4AFE which dumps uh, towards the front of the car. Actually, this is just a minor issue about the power steering lines. So definitely, you're not gonna find any of the existing power steering hoses to work. So you kind of have to make your own uh, for us, it's not so difficult because very near our shop, there are actually a couple of places that make high-pressure hoses. You just have to measure and combine existing hoses from the pump to the rack to the power steering cooler and back to the pump. Measure it up, tell them exactly how long, uh, crimp it to the connectors that are necessary, and uh, they'll give it back to you within 30 minutes. In case you just don't want to deal with that, you can always go with a manual rack and pinion so you don't have to worry about power steering. Alright guys, to conclude, this is the last part of the video. This is our Q&A segment. So there are two major concerns that I'd like to address briefly. How much would this thing cost to do? And of course, more information or specifics about wiring. These two questions, uh, unfortunately, I will not be able to answer in this video because it's really ca case to case. And more info about wiring, unfortunately, I will not definitely give more specifics on this beyond what uh, we have described to you, what you have to think about. Because uh, wiring is actually the most difficult part. We rather leave it to experts. So if you want to do it yourself, it's not too bad, you just uh, have to be very mindful of uh, wiring it yourself. But we're not going to answer um, 
sp specific wiring questions. And the, of course, the major issue is we haven't actually completed the car yet. And of course, it's going to be a race car, so our wiring needs, we don't have to integrate it with uh, the stock wiring system so well. So it just has to run and has to drive and be reliable. That's it. It doesn't have to look stock. But if you have any more questions regarding this swap, please let me know in the comments. And we might make a part 3 uh, containing the answers to your questions. And of course, we're going to complete the the swap in our car uh, that we're working on and uh, we'll let you know how that goes as well in the next installment but uh, until then this is it for me uh, thank you for watching uh, thank you for attending this uh, video seminar and uh, I hope to see you guys in the next video and if there will be a part 3 of this video uh, please stay tuned for that and as always, thanks for watching. See you guys. Ciao. God bless. Stay safe.